Good morning, Woodvale. Welcome to church this morning. Pastor Brad is on vacation, so it's my honor and privilege to get to lead in worship this morning. Why don't you stand with us for prayer. Father, we pray your blessing on everything that goes on here today. May your name be glorified. May you be honored. Just be present with us. So we look forward to seeing what you're going to do today. Thank you, Lord. All right, please sing loud with me.
Well, good morning. It is Baptism Sunday, and I want to introduce you to my friend. Can you tell everybody your name? My name is Naya Torpe. Now, we uh, looked up in the back what Naya's name, name means, right? And it means a goal or a purpose. And we believe, we're claiming that God has a purpose for Naya's life. Amen? And Naya is very determined that she's going to get baptized today. Can you tell us, Naya, how old are you? I am six, turning seven. About to turn seven. And when did you give your heart to Jesus? When I was five years old. When you were five years old. That long time ago. <laughs> and uh, Naya, why do you want to get baptized today? To follow Jesus. And that's all that's about, right? It's to follow Jesus. All right, so we're going to go in the back and we're going to do that. We're going to begin to worship God. Just make sure you give her a big cheer when they get baptized. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. the sun.
Father's house, there's a place for me. I love that one. Thank you, Lord. You are my champion. Giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle you won. I am who you say.
ask you as, you know, as your temporary worship leader here, Lord, let's open our mouths. Let's shout. Let's sing that like we mean it from every part of our being. As we sing that bridge and chorus again, just think of the words. He is our champion. Everything that means. Undefeated. Undefeatable. <laughs> sing it together. When I lift my voice and shout, How many people this morning know that Jesus is our champion? In 1 Samuel 17, it's this Bible story that many of us know, the story of David and Goliath. And what I think is so interesting, I was reading it this morning, and uh, it actually describes Goliath as the champion. The first sentence in which Goliath steps on the scene, it says there was a man named Goliath, and he was a champion from Gath. But if you know the story, it doesn't stop there. Because if that was the only champion, we wouldn't have King David. But we have a powerful God. And you see, our God is bigger than any champion. And therefore, our God is a champion of champions. And so whatever you're going through this morning, I don't know what you walked in here this morning with, but I can tell you this. My God is a champion over your situation. My God is a champion over your circumstance. And I don't know if you walked in here with sickness or disease or you're walking in here with burdens and hurt, but I can tell you right now, my God is so much bigger and he's a champion of your champion. And this morning, he can defeat it. Amen. 
This morning we're going to go into communion and just remember the sacrifice Jesus took upon that cross. But before we do that, can we just pray? Can we pause and just pray in this moment? God, we just thank you so much, Father, for how big you are. That, God, you are our champion. Despite what we are going through in life, Father, there was no one bigger than you. There was no one stronger than you. Because you are our, our almighty, powerful, heavenly Father, and you are our champion. Nothing can stand in your way. We give you thanks. God, this morning, I just pray for those who are walking in here with burdens this morning, Father. I pray right now in the name of Jesus, I pray freedom upon their situation, God. God, those who are walking in here with sick, who are sick, God, or who are, who are, who are coming in here with burdens, God, I pray deliverance right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. So God, we just give today to you. You are almighty King. And it's all about you. So we give you all honor, all praise, and all glory. Woodvale, can you just give it up for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Thank you, God. Well, you may be seated. Welcome to church this morning. This morning is one of our Unite services. We have a Unite service every month, the first week of every month. And we invite our kids into the service so there's no kids' ministries going on. And uh, we're just so excited that they're a part of our service this morning. A part of our Unite service, we have communion. And we just take a moment to remember the sacrifice Christ, Christ took upon that cross. And so in a few moments, the ushers are going to come by with some emblems, a small cup of juice, and a small wafer. Just hold on to those, and we're going to partake with together as a family. So don't take those just yet. And I ask you that you would remain seated. I know we like to stand when we worship, but if you could remain seated until the tray is passed by your aisle, and then feel free to stand. We're going to worship now. Worship team. as 
no claim on me. Then came the not yet standing, would you stand to your feet, please? This morning, we have the opportunity and privilege to remember the sacrifice Christ took upon that cross. And church, let's never forget that. The price that he paid, the price that he bore for you and I. You see, he was upon that cross and he knew you by name. And he said, I would do it anyways. He knew everything that we would do wrong. And he said, I love you so much, I would do it again. Let's never forget the price that Christ paid. He was in an upper room with his disciples and and he broke bread. And he said, this is my body. This represents my body. And eat this and remember me with it. And then he took a cup. He said, this is my blood. Drink this and remember the price I paid. This morning we're going to do that. We have some emblems. You should have a small wafer and a small cup. We don't represent this as, or we don't believe this is actually Jesus' body and blood, but just an emblem representing his body and his blood. And so this morning, if you could, could you hold your wafer high? This morning, this represents Jesus' body who was beaten for us. Can we partake and remember the sacrifice it took for Jesus this morning? And Jesus took the cup. He said, this is my blood. You see, blood represents life. And because Jesus died on the cross, you and I have life in him abundantly. And this morning we want to remember, remember the sacrifice of the cross. This morning would we partake of the cup as an emblem of his blood and remember Jesus. Go ahead and put that cup down in front of you. Church, can you give it up for the King of kings and Lord of lords, our Savior, our King, our great champion. He is worthy of all praise, all honor, all glory, every ounce of our energy. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Let's worship again. Worship team. Silence, the roaring light. 
summertime and didn't this morning feel like a nice August morning it just felt good it felt really good I always got confused this morning when we were doing a sound check I asked who knew what the temperature was when they woke up and somebody said 42 and I thought 42 what's that it's a it was 15 I thought it was 10 but that was too cold it was 15 degrees this morning on our thermometer just a nice day it's gonna warm up you know what we've been doing a summer sermon series it's been called cultivate and it's on uh, our, our text is Galatians 5, chapter, uh, chapter 5, verses 22 to 23. And this is known as the fruit of the Spirit. So we're going to take a look at that again right now. Galatians 5, 22 to 23, and it says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. We have done so far, Pastor Mark started off with, with love, and then we did joy, and then we did peace, and last Sunday Pastor Marvin did, did uh, patience. We had that cultivator out here, and the, the importance of building margin, right? Building margin into your, into your day so you can, you can accommodate things, so you can have room for patience. And today we're going to look at kindness, and uh, kindness is, is, is a, well, we're going to get into it. So here we go. Chapter 5, verse 1. The very first verse says this. It starts off like this. It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. The context of this chapter is freedom. Freedom in Christ. Stand firm and do not let yourselves be burdened by a yoke of slavery. Then in verse 7, it's starting to get a little bit personal. It says, you were running a good race. Who cut in front of you? to keep you from obeying the truth. Somebody you let, someone get in your way. Then we get into verse 14, which is how we live, how we move in freedom. It says, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If we walk by the Spirit, we will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Fruit is a result, right? Fruit grows on trees. It's a result. Uh, you could say this, uh, the fruit of our labor, so the result of our efforts, the result of our work. Fruit of the Spirit is the resultant work of the Spirit. And the singular fruit there, it's not fruit, fruits of the Spirit, right? It's fruit. How many, do you know, how many are there? How many fruit is indicated there? How many things? Did I hear a nine? You're right. There's nine. There's nine of them there. There's nine things that are there. Uh, so they all work together. You might remember the very first Sunday when Pastor Mark introduced this topic, we had a bowl, a nice big bowl of fruit on there, and everything was contained in one bowl. And he started eating. And I thought, wow. 
Every time that happens, I get hungry. And right about now, I don't know about you, but 11.45, maybe for you folks, you had a nice breakfast before you came here. So did I at 5 o'clock. My breakfast is long gone, I'll tell you that. So I'm a little bit hungry. And I thought, what better way to do this since I'm up here today? I can do what I want, right? So I borrowed some stuff from our kitchen, uh, like my kitchen at home, not our kitchen here. I think Brenda wouldn't have let me borrow anything from our kitchen. She's on it. She's on stuff that we do there. So we've got a few things. And what I wanted to try and illustrate this morning with this is the cohesiveness, the interconnectedness of the fruit. So you can imagine what's going to happen, right? You just, you just already know. But So look at this. I got this special. This is my apron for formal occasions. Here we go. It's creased right out of the package. Never been used. Because I don't get to do this too often. But you know what? Neither do I want to get my shirt dirty because I can just see the top of this thing flying wide open. Hopefully not. So there's nine fruit, right? Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Okay. So, you know what, when I started looking at this, I thought, what do you call this message? You know, like the, the, the nine fruit service, I don't know. There's a store actually called Nine Fruits. There's a shop in the States, Nine Fruits, and uh, they make smoothies. And guess what? They do not put nine fruits into their smoothies, but they're called Nine Fruit Smoothies after the nine fruit listed here in this passage. They're believers. So, okay, so we just put in bananas. So let's say bananas is love. I love bananas. And let's say the next one is peaches. So joy is peaches. And then nectarines is going to be peace. And patience, let's do all the yellow ones first. Patience can be mangoes. And then we've got a, five different berries, but they're all kind of the same color. So we've got goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Okay, there we go. All together all into one. Apparently, you know what I see? <laughs> I see some of our staff bringing in stuff in the morning, uh, like smoothies, I guess, or I don't know what it is. When you look at the color, you think, ooh, can that possibly be good? I've seen that color, but just somewhere else. <laughs> and then I think we put in a little bit of this just to sort of help it all kind of work together. All right, so if Pastor Mark is watching right now, <laughs> here we go. This is how the fruit of the Spirit works. There we go. That's got to do it. Okay, let's take a look. It looks pretty good. And actually, it's a more pleasant-looking color than some of the stuff you guys bring in. <laughs> Taste test. Oh, there we go. So not only do I get to have a little bit of a snack midday, Pastor Mark. We appreciate you, and we miss you lots, Pastor, and we're really looking forward to next Sunday. <laughs> when you talk about goodness. <laughs> okay. You know, oh, how unkind of me. I'm taking this all by myself. Who wants one? I'm going to need a volunteer, someone who can pour. Someone who can pour and not spill. Come on up, buddy. Come on up. So I need a pourer. So we'll keep a glass for you, the poor, right? And then we'll also have... All right, okay. So I only have five glasses. All right, so I'm going to say... There we go. Help yourself, but no fighting and no pushing and no pulling. Okay, I'm going to keep going over here. And you know what? We're just going to unplug this just in case. <laughs> All right. 
Thank you. So that's how it's supposed to go. Not kindness. Hey, I'm really kind. Or I've got a lot of love. Or joy. Hey, I'm really joyful. It's not that. They all flow. They all work together. I don't know if... uh, What comes to mind for you when you think of kindness? Is there something that sort of jumps to mind right away? I know for me there's a few things that do. And, uh, excuse me, some of those things are... um, you know, like getting a, an encouraging note or an encouraging email or a text from somebody. Usually with what I do, I get a lot of complaints, you could say. I get a lot of things that are wrong. This is broken, this is fixed, he's doing that, he should be doing that. I get those kind of things. I don't get, so for me, no news is good news. When I come in on Monday morning and there's nothing, whew, I'm glad. Okay. But it is always nice to get a little encouraging word every now and again, you know, just to sort of get a, have a, have a feeler out for how, how things are going. So maybe it's that for you. Maybe it's an encouraging word from someone. Maybe, uh, maybe it's a caring shoulder to cry on. Occasionally, we all need a little bit of, uh, how was it? All right, good. Occasionally, we all need just a little, go ahead. We all need a little bit of uh, encouragement every now and again, and we need someone to just kind of, you know, open up to us or let us open up to them. Um, what about this one? Food is always a good one, right? What about that aroma of, of uh, mom's oatmeal and raisin cookies when you come home after school? What about that? Have you ever had that? I experienced that growing up, and wow, that was really nice. My mom seemed to always know when to do that. We are looking forward to going to see our in-laws, my in-laws, this summer, and my mother-in-law is an incredible baker. I don't know if you've heard of the three-bun loaf, but it, apparently it's a, it's a Newfoundland tradition. It's like it looks like three big buns in the pan. But there's nothing like fresh baked bread. There's no aroma like that. I don't know if you agree with that or not, or if maybe I'm just making you hungry. But there is nothing like that at all. So what do you think of when you think of kindness? What comes to mind? What, what draws it to you? I don't know if you remember, uh, who, rem- who knows? Who knows what a VHS tape is? <laughs> I do. <laughs> Who knows what a VCR is? Okay, there's a few of us here that do. So guess what? There was this store, this chain, this huge video rental place called Blockbuster Video. And guess what? Apparently now, apparently they actually do have one location on the planet. Globally, Blockbuster has one location. It's a franchise. It's still running. So you could rent there these, uh, well, VHS tapes. They were, in case you don't don't know, they were kind of rectangular, big, chunky plastic things with tape inside on reels that spun around in your VCR. And uh, remember tracking? Do you remember that? Trying to get the tracking right? Can you dial it? And it all comes in. Anyway, they started this thing. They started this program because they found that after so many, like people just weren't rewinding them. That's the bottom line. People just were not rewinding them. They were throwing them back in the box and in the bin, and nothing's rewound, and the staff have to do it. So they thought, how can we get around this? So they started this program, and they stuck a little sticker. You open up the box, there's your cassette right there, and there's a little round sticker there, and it said this. It said, be kind, rewind, right? Be kind, rewind. So they reduced kindness to a simple courtesy, uh, a self-serving one at that. But be kind, rewind. Kindness does include common courtesy, but it's much more than that as well. And that's what we're going to get into a little bit today. Mark Twain said this. Mark Twain said, Kindness is the language which the deaf can hear and which the blind can see. That tells me that it is something that is personal and it is something that is experiential. We experience it personally. We offer it personally. Kindness is, uh, it includes attributes such as loving affection, Sympathy, friendliness, patience, pleasantness, gentleness, and goodness. It's a quality shown in the way that we speak and in the way that we act. Kindness is not an emotion. It's not a feeling. It's a choice. We choose it. We choose to be that way. There's a Greek word for kindness, as as is used in Scripture. And the Greek word is pronounced Christotois. And what that word means is uh, compassion and faithfulness, but to one's 
obligations as well as to one's relatives, friends, and slaves. So your obligations. So it's the things within culture, within society that you have to do. So whether that's anything. So if I look at me, for example, my obligations includes work, it includes church, it includes family, it includes friends. It's everything. Everything that I am. It's all inclusive. So kindness is to be a part of us in that way. It's to be a, an all-inclusive part. It can't be removed. Um, how do we live out kindness? Um, there's a few, fortunately, Scripture gives us a few key verses that offer parameters for us. So let's take a look at some of those. First one is found in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, and it says this, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Second verse is this, from Titus, chapter 3. It says, But when the kindness and love of our God, of God, sorry, let me start over. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. Let's read it again. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, He saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. Kindness is an attribute of God. It's also a characteristic of true love. And if you've been to a wedding, more than likely you've heard this passage there. It's very common for weddings. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is known as the love chapter. I'm just going to read a couple of verses from it, but it says this, Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it's not proud, it does not dishonor others, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, and it always perseveres. Love never fails. We're encouraged to offer it to others. In the Gospels, we read about that. Ephesians. Uh, we've, uh, so kindness. Kindness is a choice. Basically, it comes down to that. It's a choice to show loving affection, sympathy, friendliness, patience, gentleness, and goodness. It's a choice. It's a quality in the way we speak and in the way we act. What I like to do, we've got a subject. I like to see it in action. I like to like, how do we see this in action? There's tons of videos. If you Google kindness or go to BibleGateway.com and search kindness, you'll find all kinds of things. There's so many there. We're only going to look at a few of them today. But one that comes to mind is David to Mephibosheth. Pastor Kyle mentioned about reading about David and Goliath this morning. Further down in, in Samuel, 2 Samuel uh, chapter 9, we read about David and Mephibosheth. So we're going to take a look at that one right now. David and Mephibosheth. Let's watch kindness in action. Okay, scripturally. So it starts off this way, chapter 9 uh, in Second Samuel. Verse 1 says, David asked, Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? So there's a backstory. I'm just going to quickly give you the backstory. The backstory is um, King David was not always King David. King David was the guy who slayed the giant, the champion. King David was brought into Saul's house. He was a servant there for a while. King David was a part and, and kind of rubbed shoulders with some of the family, including one of Saul's sons, Jonathan. Jonathan and Saul were similar in age and stage in life, and they just became really good friends. And over time, they made a pact. And David's part was to protect Jonathan's family. So whatever may come, David was to reach out and protect Jonathan's family. One day, King Saul and all of his sons are in battle, and they were defeated. They didn't come home. The palace, when they got word of this, was in an uproar, and people were fleeing as fast as they could to find a place of safety, because it's all now everything is uncertain. Jonathan had a son, and his son's name was Mephibosheth. 
And the maid that was looking after Mephibosheth picked him up quickly and ran as fast as she could go, as far as she could go. Unfortunately, along the way, she dropped him, and he suffered a, a permanent injury. He was lame in both of his feet, which meant that he couldn't work. As an adult who couldn't work, you were more of a drain on society than a help. All this plays into this today. So here we are. Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. So Ziba was a servant who used to serve Saul, him and his family. And David asked Ziba, who's left? And Ziba says, there is, there is one. There's still a son of Jonathan. He's lame in both feet. Where is he? King David asked. Ziba said, he's at the house of Machir. So King David had him brought from Machir's house to the castle. To the castle. And when Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor, because now Mephibosheth is an adult, to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. Do not be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that your grandfather Saul owned. Imagine that. You're going from a place of nothing to a place of everything. And you will always eat at my table. He's going from a place that probably, probably the name of Saul probably got him a few points here and there in the community and maybe a few favors, but he was living at, you know, the, below the poverty line, you could say. And now he's brought up and he's living in the castle. You will always eat at my table. Amazing. Mephibosheth didn't deserve to be able to eat at the king's table, but the king freely invited him to do so. Sound familiar? We have done nothing to deserve salvation. Yet God offers that to us. We are invited to eat at the king's table. The king of kings. The lord of lords. I've got my invitation. Have you got yours? That's an incredible story of kindness. It's not a feeling, it's a choice. There's another passage that I'd like to share with you. This is the unmerciful servant. And this is found in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18, starting in verse 21. I got a new Bible a while ago, and I think it's called, like, giant, extra, super, huge print. It's... <laughs> It's really big letters. I can see them really well. I'm very thankful for that. Okay, so Matthew chapter 18, starting down at verse 21. The parable of the unmerciful servant. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times. Seven was considered the perfect number. Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77. So not just, not a little bit, Peter. A whole lot. Keep doing it. Don't stop. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold. Who knows what 10,000 bags of gold would be valued at today? A lot. Like kajillions, right? My kids didn't know that Google is actually a number. It is. <laughs> It refers to a number with, what, a hundred times a hundred zeros or something? It's a big, 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 big number. A lot. This guy owed his master a lot of money. And look what he says. Um, Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The service master took pity on him, and he canceled the debt and let him go. Wow. Can you imagine walking out of there that day? Like, what just hit me? You're just an unbelief. But guess what this guy does? This fellow (laughs) comes up and happens to bump into someone who owes him 100 bucks. So you think, okay, like a bazillion dollars versus $100. 
Not a lot, comparatively. His, and this guy owed him money. He demanded it. Pay me back. And then he started choking him and started like a headlock and pay it back now. And his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. Sounds familiar? But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay back the debt. When the other servants saw this, guess what they did? It's like, <gasps> ooh. They were not <laughs> impressed at all. They went back to the servant and said, you know that guy? Yeah, that guy. Guess what he did? <laughs> so, the king calls him back in. What are you doing? I forgave you a bazillion dollars, and you can't free this guy like ten bucks? What's wrong with you? So what he did was, he threw him in jail until he could pay it. You're done. That's it. None of this. We're not going to have that. The message of this story in our context is this. Kindness should lead us to kindness. Kindness should push forward. Titus said, we read it already, but Titus says he saved us through his son Jesus. Um, when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. The thing about kindness is that none of us deserves it or can earn it. It's nothing you can work for. Kindness is free and it is merciful. We've been shown the most amazing act of kindness that's ever existed, kind of like Mephibosheth. We did not deserve to eat at the king's table, but the king blesses us and invites us to his table. The unmerciful servant, we've been, we're like that as well. We've been forgiven a debt that we could never repay. Our sin is something that we can't repay. You can't right all the wrongs that you've made all your life. It's not going to happen. God's great kindness and compassion allow that to happen. Our life should be characterized by kindness. Colossians 3.12 says we're told to clothe ourselves with kindness. We are to love our enemies and do good to them. I don't know if you ever, uh, as a kid maybe, you might have seen a show with this guy named Fred, Fred Rogers, not Fred Flintstone, Fred Rogers. He had a neighborhood uh, that he lived in called Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Imagine that. Imagine if your neighborhood was called like J.C.'s Neighborhood or, or mine could be called Joe's Neighborhood. That would be a nice neighborhood because I'm in it, right? <laughs> so when you got your own neighborhood, what can go wrong? Mr. Rogers had a couple of things, clothing ourselves in kindness. He had this, this physical way of showing that. Every show, he comes into the house with an outdoor sweater and outdoor shoes. He takes off the outdoor sweater and the outdoor shoes, and then he puts on indoor shoes and an indoor sweater. Every single show started off the same way. I think, what's with that? But everything he did was to show kindness. It's a change. He's, he, was, he was kind. He was kind to all of those in the neighborhood. If you've seen it, you know what I mean. There's a couple of examples, too, that we see here uh, in Scripture, and I'd like to take us to those in Luke's Gospel. If you look at uh, uh, in ch Luke chapter 7, starting at verse 11, there's the woman from Nain. And now you might remember this one. Jesus went to a town called Nain. And his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. And as he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out. In a box, they were being carried out. This person was the only son of his mother. And she was a widow. So this woman had, had suffered great loss in her life. This woman had lost the ability uh, to provide, to be provided for. This woman had, had not a lot of hope. Life was going to be very, very hard for her. So she's grieving not just the loss of her son, but the loss of any kind of foreseeable good future. Jesus saw her. It says here in verse 10, for verse 13, when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, don't cry. And then he went up to those that were carrying the box. They stood, stopped and stood still. He put his hand on it, and he said, young man, I say to you, get up. And the man sat up, and he began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. That is kindness. There's another one, you know, where, where he went to Lazarus' tomb. 
And just the, the shortest verse in the Bible follows that. Jesus wept. Just the kindness that he could show. We see another one in, in, uh, in Luke chapter 8, just further down. Verse 40. Jesus, there's a double header here. Jesus raises a dead girl, and uh, on the way he heals a sick woman. And uh, he's going to the town. He's on his way there. On his way in, uh, a man from the synagogue named Jairus comes and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading, come to my house, my daughter's not well, she's dying. Jesus goes along with him. On the way, there's all these crowds, people pushing and shoving, and this woman was in the crowd who had been suffering for many, many years, and no one could help her. And she thought, if I can just touch his cloak. So she worked her way through the crowd, and she just touched his cloak, and right away, instantly she was healed, and instantly Jesus felt the power drained from him, it says in Scripture. Who touched me? He said. And Peter's like, seriously? <laughs> We're in a crowd of thousands of people, chief, and you want to know who touched you? And he said, someone touched me. I could feel the power drained from me. The woman, realizing that she was going to be found out eventually, just approached him and said, that, that, it was me. It was me. I did that. And so look at what Jesus said to her. He said, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. That is kindness. That is amazing kindness. We need to love our neighbor as ourselves. That was the instruction in one of our verses. Love your neighbor as yourself. Think about this. Jesus goes through his ministry. He's, uh, he's now been arrested. He's now before Pilate. He's been sentenced to judgment. The Roman soldiers have him. They're not being kind to him at all. And what does he say to them? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. So some people who are committing horrible things, he's forgiving them. He's asking God to forgive them. That's kindness. He's on a cross. On either side of him are other criminals. And one of those says to him, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, Surely I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. His last words were kindness. He was offering kindness. <clears throat> then we get to an incredible part in this story. And there's a part there that I honestly kind of read over a whole lot. But if you look at, at Mark, here's what it says. Uh, starting around verse 16. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, after Jesus was put in the tomb, the next morning they get up, they go to the tomb, they want to prepare the body with spices and stuff like that. That's their tradition. So they're on their way to do that. They get there, the big stone's rolled away, and there's a big bright light coming out of there, and there's an angel there. And the angel sees them. And when they enter the tomb, a man dressed in white, sitting on the right side, and he says to them, don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who is crucified. He is risen, praise God. He's risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. But here, here it is. But go tell his disciples and Peter. And Peter. Was not Peter one of the disciples? So why, why is he singling out Peter? Why and Peter? So you think about that for a second. Peter just... The day before, maybe a couple of days before, Peter did what? Before the rooster crowed, Peter denied Jesus. How many times? Not once, not twice, three times. Three times. Three times. He didn't just let his friend down at his most deepest point of need. Jesus, Peter denied even knowing him three times so imagine this now imagine if that were you and you were the one that had denied the king of kings the lord of lords three times you would probably be feeling kind of low i would say kind of blue kind of sad very guilty probably shamed all kinds of things you would be feeling right out of it this is where the personal part comes in so in scripture thousands of years till today in scripture Peter's name is there Jesus reached out to touch Peter he knew exactly 
what Peter needed at that moment. Kindness is gentle and kindness is mild. It's not harsh. It's not harsh at all. We've probably all kind of had those moments where we've been offered uh, maybe something good, but not, you know, like it just didn't jive. Like it could be somebody throws the money at you instead of just going and paying for you. Or it could be, you know, your parents. This is the, I'll give you a story from my life. I was a kid. Believe it or not, I was a child once and a long time ago. And as the oldest and as a boy in our family, I was uh, supposed to be the responsible one. So what that meant was if parents come home and something's amiss, something's gone wrong, they're going to come right to me. That's how it goes. That was <laughs> the communication channel. came right to me. And uh, so I had to kind of be aware of what everybody was doing or not. This one day, something happened. It wasn't good. My mom came home, and suddenly there was an engraving on our, her mahogany uh, buffet unit in the dining room. And I thought, whoa, that's kind of a cool picture. It looks familiar. It looks like something my sister draws like a zillion times every day. Guess what she said? He did it. <laughs> so who took the punishment for that? I did. I took the punishment for that. So you know what? Who knows this feeling? You've cried so hard and so long, there's no water left in your eyes, and your throat's all lumpy, and your stomach feels horrible, and you're just sitting there feeling bad. Has anybody, has anybody ever felt like that ever in your life? Yeah, okay, so you get it. So then, the truth comes out, and there's some murmurings downstairs. I'd been sent to my room. Dad comes up and says, Yep, Simon's at the door. He wants, to go. he wants you to come out and play soccer. I think you should go. Your sister told us what really happened. Go play soccer, have fun. So I was like, no, I'm not going to play soccer. I don't want to play soccer. I don't want to do anything. I'm not going to go play soccer. So dad now was like, you, yes, you are. You're going to go play soccer. No, I'm not going to play. So he picks me up, takes me out, play soccer, have fun. <laughs> That's harsh. <laughs> That's kind of harsh. You've probably done something like that. I know I probably have. I know for sure I have. So kindness is not harsh. Kindness aims to do good in a way that is gentle and mild, in a way that is sensitive to the needs of people. We want to be seeing what people need. My grandfather used to say this. He used to say, keep your eyes open and look for what needs to be done and do it. That's the way to success. Do that. Do that and you will succeed. We need to see what people need. We need to be sensitive to that. What the Spirit works is a unity all of the fruit is to be evident in your life altogether. Kindness is connected with goodness. If you don't have goodness, you won't have kindness. The fruit is bound together in unity by love. Kindness is how love behaves. You could look at it that way. If you don't show kindness, it means you don't have love. If you don't show kindness, it means you don't have goodness. We need to clothe ourselves with that goodness. We need to wrap it right on. Wrap it around us. Make it a part of us. Kindness is better understood through practice. It's a doing thing. Kindness is better understood through practice. Nike had a slogan, just do it. Just do it. Here are five ways that we can cultivate kindness. Number one is touch. Touch is important. Touch is, is the way humans connect, the way we bond. Touch is very important. We use it all the time. A touch from God. Did God actually physically touch you? Or did you feel his presence, right? Touch is so physical. It's so important. I'm not a hugger. I do give hugs, but I'm not a hugger. I'm, I, I would be like, like this in a hug. The hugs, that's not me. I will shake your hand forever. I will shake your hand. I'll give you a pat on the back. The shoulder hug thing, that's kind of, that's good. I can do that. But the two arms right around, oh, I don't like that at all. I am, so just so you know, I am way out of my comfort zone <laughs> if I have given you a big hug. Way out. Way far out. But touch is an important thing. You can foster that in children. How do we encourage kids to touch? Sometimes the butterfly kisses, right? I would never expect to, you know, share butterfly kisses with anybody. But my kids could when they were little, right? Um, 
touch can have an amazing effect on a person. A smile, the smile campaign. You know that the first smiley face from 1963, there used to be buttons in the 60s. It actually reflected the era. That was a course developed by an advertising agency. <laughs> Go figure, huh? A guy named Harvey R. Ball developed the uh, smiley face as a program to help a company. A company had had two insurance companies had merged, poor morale, they came up with a program, the smiley face became part of it, it succeeded. But there's something about a smile, isn't there? There's something truthfully, something good about a smile. All those emoticons, so, so many of those things are smiley faces or variations of that. There's something about a smile that just encourages somebody. A smile can lighten up a room. It can just brighten up the whole place. I mean, you, meet, you know what? There's a guy named Jones who's often at door number one on Sunday mornings, one of our greeters. That guy, I got to say, I don't know, are you here, buddy? Are you here today? Because he has got the most amazing smile that I've ever seen, I think. It's just this big, handsome, beautiful smile. It's incredible. A smile can change everything. I had a conversation with a gentleman at the paint store a little while ago. We were talking about different things going on in the world around us and, you know, the manhunt and all that stuff and, in uh, Canada. And when you, learn, you start to learn, the media pulls out all kinds of details and you learn about some of the character traits and the trouble, the childhood, all that kind of stuff. And you wonder, honestly, like, what would have happened if that guy just received a few more smiles? You know, would it have made a difference? I believe it would have. I believe it would. If we can, if people can, we're, we're meant to be in community, right? We're meant to do life together. If we could just smile a little bit. Why don't you start a smile campaign? How about that? You know what? I did this. I actually did this uh, a couple years ago. In my car, you ever, you ever think that a lot of people, when they're in their car, they think that no one's looking at them in their car, unless they have a convertible and the top's down, right? They think that no one's looking at them because then they want people to look at, look at me in my car. Then they want that. But the rest of the time, they don't think anybody's looking at them in their car. And you can tell by some of the things that they're doing that they don't think that anyone else is looking at them while they're driving their car. <laughs> smile. I started smiling. I started smiling on the way to work. I started smiling on the way home, just smiling a lot. And sometimes you're at a stoplight and you just kind of look over and smile. And the person over there is like, you know, what's just start a smile. Yeah, I imagine when they get to work, this guy was staring at me at the intersection. He was smiling. <laughs> what's with that? Start a smile campaign and just smile at people. Wave at people. We had the opportunity to visit Bermuda once, and a uh, beautiful place. And the best way to get around, they said, was just to rent one of these mopeds. I don't know if you've ever seen one of those. It's like this little tiny mini bike kind of thing that you can actually pedal if you had to. In Bermuda, you drive on the left side of the road. The guy says, the guy, really pleasant guy, you know, imagine this guy with like cargo shorts and a Hawaiian shirt and sunglasses. He's the guy at the rental shop and flip-flops. So he's, he's just kind of telling us, this is where you started, this is where you put the gas in, the whole thing, like seven bucks of gas for the week. It was really good on gas. And uh, he says, you'll need this. Helmet, he goes, road rash. You gotta avoid the road rash. He goes, and just smile. Smile a lot, people will forgive you. So, <laughs> You know, all these people driving these things all over town, all over the place, on the wrong side of the road, probably, especially when you're making that turn, right? You're making that turn, and you want to go into the far lane. It's like, oh, got to pull back in. Left turns usually are far away. Right turns are close. It's opposite. So smile. Just smile a lot. Kind words. Proverbs says, an anxious heart weighs a man down, but kind words cheer him up. A gentle answer turns away wrath, and, uh, but harsh words stir up stir up anger kind kind words we can share kind words you know what sometimes sure there can be reasons to be upset i've had several of those already today there, there can be reasons to be upset but you know what we don't have to we don't have to show that we don't have to be upset verbally we can share kind words with people listening ears i gotta say this one for me is probably the toughest one of all these five. Listening ears. Some people think I'm a good listener. I don't think I'm a particularly good listener, but other people think I am. So listening can be very trying at times. Who's a listener? Just, you know, like, you don't have to put up your hand. You know who you are. Who's a listener? You know what it's like to have people come and expect you to listen. And you're thinking, you ever had this analogy? When you have a can of fire, 
and you put the lid on, what's going to happen? Eventually, the oxygen is going to burn up. <laughs> Eventually, it's going to stop, and it'll, and it'll just get to a point where then you can respond. But a listening ear, a listening ear can be so valuable for people. I have met, I don't know how many people that honestly, yes, I am absolutely positive that counseling will help you. It will. But you know what? So would just a a listening ear from time to time. So would just a relationship with someone that you can talk with, someone that you can talk to. That can be a very powerful thing. Let's be open to those kinds of things. Just be a listening ear for someone. Small acts of caring. Small acts of caring. Random acts of kindness. This is like a wave that's like sweeping the nation. Kindness. There's, there's seminars on kindness. There's people who come to your school or your office and teach you how to be kind and how to be, you know, it's like, wow, really? When did we forget? But kindness, we need to be, show it through acts, acts of service. Pastor Kyle, our amazing senior high pastor, does this with your children, my children. He does that with you guys. Those random acts of kindness. You save up your cash, you pool it all together, you go out through the town on an evening in groups, and you start just simply blessing people. Stand in line at Tim Hortons and just keep paying for people and let them know. Let them know who and why. Go to the grocery store, same thing. Gas station, same thing. Just do all these kinds of things randomly for people. And every single time, Pastor Kyle shares with us stories from there that come out of there. Amazing stories. Stories of how, you know what? A mom was looking like, how am I going to pay for my groceries? And then when she got to the cash, she had more than what she had money for. And all of a sudden, somebody paid for that. Stuff like that. The conversations that come up through that. It's amazing. It is amazing. Random acts of kindness. We can, we can do random acts of kindness intentionally. How about that? Random acts of kindness intentionally. I think... We often underestimate the power of a touch, the power of a smile, a kind word, a listening ear, an honest compliment from time to time might be nice. The smallest act of caring could totally change someone's life. And that's the thing. You never actually know. I used to say this to my kids all the time because whenever we were walking, they would always notice this. You always talk to everybody. It always takes too long <laughs> when, we're, when we're on our way to the park or on our way to doing something. Because I do that. At home, I do that. When we're out walking, I'm talking to people as they come by with their dogs. And you know what? Maybe it's the same in your neighborhood. I'm sure it probably isn't too different. But a lot of people don't make eye contact. They'll kind of like do this and just keep walking right on by with their dog over here. Or they'll stop and bend over and do the poop and scoop thing while you're there. You know, they'll avoid you. You ever notice when two parents go by with strollers? Where are the eyes on the kids? They lock right into each other as, as you go by. <clears throat> I always said this was my answer. You know why I do that? Because you never know what a kind word, what a handshake, what just a very easy conversation can do for someone to lift them up out of where they're at. You never, never know. So we have to do it. So this one day, I'm out with Kimberly. I'm, she's, she's holding my hand. And we're doing the same thing. And there was this one place just before we kind of turned up the path to our place. There's an older guy on the front lawn raking leaves. I'm looking for a point, you know, an eye contact moment wasn't happening, so I thought, okay, we'll keep on going. Then all of a sudden I hear sobbing. She's crying. So we stop. I'm talking with her. Why are you so upset? You didn't say hello to that man. What if he's having a really bad day? And now he's going to have a really bad day all day, because we didn't say hi. (laughs) I thought, wow, okay, they get it. She's getting it. So we turned around and went back, and we corrected corrected that. These things are powerful. These things are very powerful, folks. They're easy to do. And that's what kindness is. It's a choice. It's something we choose to do. Be sensitive to what people are looking for, to what people need. And in that, we can show God's love and grace to people. I'm going to ask the worship team to come on back up. And uh, we're going to... We're going to... You know what? Why don't we all stand up? We've been sitting for a long time. I'm the only one that's had some sustenance this morning. Someone said in between services, they said, Ooh... (laughs) <laughs> warm smoothies that's got to be the grossest thing ever but I don't know I didn't think it was too bad kindness the kindness of God appears to us through the life of Jesus thank you sweetheart 
God saw a whole lot of hurt, a whole lot of brokenness and despair. He saw people with no hope, breaking free from pain and suffering. And so he sent his son Jesus to the rescue. There wasn't any logical reason for him to do that. No one deserved that kindness. And really, who brought that suffering on us? Probably we brought it on ourselves in a lot of cases. But thankfully, God didn't treat us like we deserved. That's what sin does. Sin binds you. It shackles you. It locks you in. It locks you into a wrong way, a disobedient way. It takes away your desire to do things God's way. My way is the only way when I'm locked into sin. We were deceived. The world says there's things that will make you happy. Cars, clothes, popularity. We're captives to the lusts of our flesh. That's what stands between us and freedom. But when we accept the truth, the true life comes only through Jesus Christ. The chains are broken and we are set free. Perhaps you're here today and you've been listening, but you've never accepted your freedom. Perhaps you're like Peter. You felt you've said something or done something that God could never forgive. I don't want to single anybody out today because I know who you, you know who you are. But I would like to invite you. I would like to invite you to accept your invitation to eat at the Lord's table, at the King's table. I would like to invite you to accept the freedom that is yours in Christ Jesus. I would like to invite you to accept Jesus into your heart. It's free and it's easy. We're in the habit of doing this here at Woodville. We're going to pray a very simple prayer and we'd like to invite you to join us in doing that. So as we do that, if every eye could be closed and every head bowed, just repeat this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, Today I acknowledge my sin. Today I ask for forgiveness and accept your offer. Your offer to freely forgive me. Today I invite you into my heart. I give my life to serve you. Amen. If you have prayed that prayer today, you have made the best decision of your life in Woodville. Let's congratulate those people who have done that today. If you prayed that prayer, please tell someone. Please tell me. Please tell the person you came with. Please tell the person at the follow wall, if you like. On your way out of the auditorium this morning, you'll see this wall. It's got follow, connect, and serve written on it in big letters. Go to the part that says follow. There's someone there that was so looking forward to meeting you today. And they've got something for you. It's free. They've got a Bible and they have a study book for you. Just for you for free. Just for being here. I would like to just, rem just conclude our service this morning with a prayer. And after we pray that prayer, if our altar team would come forward. And if anybody has need for prayer, personal prayer today. You know what, Pastor Mark has said this many, many times, folks. The biggest room in his house is the room for improvement. I'm with him there. You know what? In all of these things, as the fruit of the Spirit grows in us, we have room. There is room for margin last week. There is room for kindness. We need to work and develop those things. Let's pray. Let's pray. And altar team, why don't you come on forward? Heavenly Father, whose blessed Son Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. Bless all who, following in his steps of kindness, give themselves to the service of others with compassion and kindness, that with wisdom, patience, and courage they may minister in his name to the suffering, the friendless, and the needy for the love of him who in kindness and compassion laid down his life for us. 
your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Folks, thank you so much for being here today. If you need prayer, please come forward. God bless you.